Welcome to today's webinar on giving across borders options for tax effective gift giving. I'm Ashley Murphy, the founder and principal of Arate Wealth Strategies Australia, working with Australians in America and Americans in Australia to bring strategy, structure, clarity, confidence, and compliance to your global financial affairs. So let's get into today's presentation. Of course, you would be wise to uh, engage with uh, an appropriate advisor or tax professional individually, uh, given this is not personal advice, this is general in nature only. Um, also note that uh, each month's presentations for those that register, you'll be notified of when they are up on YouTube. And if you want to go and see our YouTube channel, you'll see all manner of uh, interesting niche topics for, for folks uh, whose lives crosses these particular borders. Okay, a little bit about me. So really the issues of cross-border uh, financial complications have been with me since birth uh, as a tri-citizen of the UK, Australia, and the US. It's raised here in Brisbane, where I currently am and will be for the next six months before returning to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I lived for seven years and before that, 10 years in the San Francisco Bay Area. I come from a background in IT and business management, but really my calling was to be a financial advisor. That was evident from a young age when I think back to uh, to certain conversations I was privy to with uh, with my parents and, uh, and, and, and other such things. So uh, it's a privilege to now work in this capacity and, and share my knowledge uh, and partner with clients to be able to help them to make better financial decisions, leading overall to, to greater life uh, satisfaction and, and know that there have been fewer opportunities missed and, uh, and, and better decisions made. So with that, let's move on. Um, types of clients we work with, you can see here, would be the Australian business owner, the high net worth family currently living in the U.S., uh, and looking to move abroad and the Australian executive family permanently relocating to the U.S. and needing to get their, their situation set up uh, for the U.S. So without further ado, getting into today's presentation, there's a number of definitions we need to go through in order to have a good conversation here and for you to understand what is being conveyed. Firstly, we need to define the three definitions of residency. We need to talk about this term transfer taxes that's used in the US. You don't hear that so much in Australia for reasons I'll get into later. Uh, we'll talk about the lifetime unified transfer tax exemption. That's 12.96 million uh, per person uh, for, for US citizens in the US. Uh, excuse me. We'll have to define tangible and intangible property, the situs of an asset. Uh, and then before we get into uh, U.S. Uh, gift tax considerations and what that looks like when uh, when making donations to various individuals or charities. And then lastly, you can see it's cut off a little bit, but lastly, we're going to go through and see the reverse of that and see what it looks like on the Australian side. OK, if you have any questions throughout, I love making this interactive, so feel free to chat in. Ideally, use the chat and not the Q&A because the q and is a, a little bit clunky. Um, just feel free to chat in and, and that'll bring up a little uh, alarm and I'll see that and, uh, and can answer your question in turn. All right. So let's, be, let's first begin with residency definitions. We, we need to be aware that the U.S. has three definitions of residency. They being, there's your legal residency. Are you a citizen, permanent resident, or in the US in some kind of visa? There's your tax residency, which is entirely unrelated to your legal residency, insofar as one could be in the US illegally and still be a US tax resident. That's how little they have to do with each other. So tax residency is really a function of... Um, of two things, either what's called the green card test, i.e. do you have a green card? Um, as citizens are always US tax residents, no matter what. Uh, so the green card test and the substantial presence test, which is a, a day's count of the number of days an individual has been in the, in the US. Uh, and, and there's actually a formula used for that where it goes back three years prior and counts a certain number of days to arrive at 183 days or more 
uh, in the current year, in which case the, 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 you, would, you would be considered a US resident, taxable on your worldwide uh, income and, and financial activity, including gifting, as we'll get to in a minute. But most important for today is this third definition. So estate tax residency. Now, gift and estate tax are typically mentioned in the same breath, and the reason for that is because of this unified transfer tax credit that we're, we're going to talk about a little bit later. So estate tax and gifting, as, as is the case here, is determined by your domicile status. And that's where an individual intends to make their permanent home. And that's where this gets rather confusing because an individual may only be a visa holder in the US, yet still through their actions have clearly indicated that that is their domicile and that they plan on being there for the rest of their lives. We'll see uh, a little more detail in just a moment about domicile and what, what um, goes into that definition. So US citizens and residents are subject to transfer taxes. Transfer taxes meaning the tax that's due when you transfer an asset to another person that's either done with a warm hand as a gift or with a cold hand from the grave and in the form of the estate tax. And that's on worldwide assets. So I, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that every single presentation <laughs> that we that we offer, we start with this fact. And, and thankfully, I think that's gotten out and people understand that by now, that if you're a US citizen or tax resident, then you're taxed on your worldwide activity. So residency for transfer tax purposes is determined by one's domicile. Uh, and and or if or if you're a U.S. citizen, then it doesn't matter. In which case, you're still subject to U.S. gift taxes. So, in other words, I have clients, U.S. citizens, that have moved to Australia, that intend on staying here for the rest of their lives, but they will still be impacted by this unified gift and estate tax credit that we're coming to. So domicile can be defined as where you intend to live permanently. As I said, there's a slide coming up with, with more detail on that. Mere residency without the intention to remain does not constitute domicile. So if you're like, nah, I'm living in California for the next couple of years, we're going to see how it goes. Is that domicile? No, that's not. That's, that's something uh, that, that, that's, that's less than domicile. Um, we do, in fact, have a, a, a very extensive list that, that have recently come into of, uh, of facts that would indicate one's domicile. But to be honest, that's not something clients typically would look at me for. That's really the estate planner that would be the one that would uh, that would help with that sort of thing. So the following facts and circumstances may be used to establish domicile. You can see here the length of stay in the U.S., frequency of travel, the nature of the, the size, cost of nature of the home, businesses, social contacts, membership in religious and other organizations, where you get your insurance, uh, do you have pets in the country, driver's licenses, bank account, all these different things go into determining residency. So moving on a little bit here, the unified transfer tax exemption, what is this? This is this 19, it's, excuse me, $12,920,000 amount that exists in 2023. But what's important to note about that, people, is that this is set to sunset in 2025. So while it is that today, and it will index next year and, and kick up a little bit more, it is scheduled to be put up for debate in 2025. Now, the only thing we can say for sure is that there will be lobbying there will be fierce, there'll be brown paper bags passed to, to senators and congressmen to, to, to see who can change that. It was not long ago that that amount was 5 million, and it wasn't long before that that it was actually 2 million. So, yes, we've had inflation, but to, for it to be 13 million in 2023 is far in excess of what it has been historically. Uh, the other thing to note is that ever since the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, there's now automatic spousal portability is the term that they use. Portability is important to understand if you have a US citizen spouse. Why? Because if you predecease your spouse or vice versa, if they predecease you, then 
you double your exemption. So congratulations, you've got about $26 million before you have to worry about estate tax. But one of my favorite international tax and estate planners who uh, I've come to meet and, and have joint clients with over the years, he put it to me rather bluntly. He said, paying the US estate tax is essentially optional because there are very clear estate planning strategies that can be implemented to deal with that. And it's just, and, and I thought that was a bold statement. I asked him to explain his position and he did. And, and I agreed. I was like, well, I, I understand it. The other point that he made is there is a clear difference. And I think everyone on today's call that shows up live that has the commitment to actually attend and, and, and be here as, as we run through this and engage, hopefully in a conversation, understands there is a paramount difference between planning and problem solving. Planning is when you make moves so that your, your, your outcomes are more favorable to you and your family. Problem solving is when you may pay some attention to the issues that, that occur, but you do nothing. And then the situation occurs anyway, in which case uh, I certainly don't have a job because I'm not a problem solver for things that have already happened. Actually, I, I do end up doing a bit of that, but Planning is not problem solved. Problem solving happens when there is no planning. So we try and avoid that as much as possible. Anyway, I digress. So some gifts don't count towards this unified lifetime uh, exemption that we see here. US citizen spouses can gift an unlimited amount to each other. There's annual transfers that may be made to a non-citizen US spouse. If you have a permanent resident spouse, uh, then that can be uh, up to $175,000 that can be gifted. That's something that comes up with clients when we're dealing with exit tax planning. If there's, if we've got some number of years to plan ahead, then we can try and equalize uh, estates or get money out of someone's estate in order to to help them mitigate the estate, uh, excuse me, the exit tax issues that that may uh, come upon them uh, at their relinquishment. U.S. citizens may make gifts of up to $17,000 to any individual. So that would be children or, or really anyone else that they, they want to make a gift to. Uh, and of course, couples through gift splitting can do double that. It's important to note, we just looked at all these exemptions and rules and whatever, but just as we saw last month with the totalization treaties that applies for Social Security, we have the same thing here with the gift and estate tax treaties in that is here are the basic rules. But if you have an estate treaty with us, the US, then things will be different. And how will they be different? They vary quite a bit. Unlike with totalization agreements, which were fairly, uh, they were a lot more uniform. Estate tax treaties are the opposite. They are not uniform. In fact, the fundamental structure of them shifted uh, between those that were were written in the 1950s and 60s to the more recent versions, where they they they've um, they've redone the way that they consider an asset to be located and first taxable by which country. In any event, you see the 16 countries here where there are such treaties. Now, it's important to understand that countries differ dramatically in how they go about applying gift estate or generation skipping tax. That's what GSTT is. It's not a super goods and services tax. Uh, heavens forbid, it's a generation skipping transfer tax is what GSTT stands for. And depending on the treaty, you actually see more of these added in. So in the case of Australia, I'll let, uh, uh, I'll, I'll get ahead of myself and I'll say it, that the non-resident alien, that charming term that's used for, for, for folks, Australians that are not Americans and you're not permanent residents, not visa holders, not citizens, uh, they essentially get that lifetime unified credit. So that $13 million amount that we're talking about right now. And furthermore, it only applies, they would only have to pay that anyway on US CITUS assets. I hear you say, what is CITUS? Well, I'll get to that in a minute. There's a few more definitions we need to get through, but I just wanted to mention the presence of this treaty. So uh, in total, we, we really are concerned with three treaties when planning our cross-border lives. There's the income tax treaty, the totalization treaty, and the gift and estate tax treaty. Now, Australia taxes this in a fundamentally different way, and I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. 
But first, let's talk about gift taxes for non-resident aliens. So what is the property that a non-resident alien would own and be worried about the U.S. maybe getting their hands on if they were to gift it away? The only thing they could be worried about would be U.S. situs property, and that is property that is deemed to be, situs is Latin for site or location, and that is property that is located in the U.S. So if you had someone, the scenario that I could imagine is, uh, maybe as an American who uh, relinquished their citizenship or a permanent resident that moved back to Australia or a visa holder who bought property in the U.S. while they were there. And then they moved back to Australia in any of the uh, aforementioned three situations that that individual, they were a former, uh, excuse me, the second one I meant to say, a former green card holder, they've relinquished their, their green card. In those those three situations, they would be non-resident aliens as far as the US is concerned. They have investor property there. So that's where Uncle Sam comes in and says, okay, you're a non-resident alien with the US side as property. That means we get to tax you on this. The good news for Aussies is that we inherit the, the, uh, the, the lifetime unified exemption anyway, so it really wouldn't matter. But for folks from countries that don't have such a treaty, Wait for it. It is nasty. Do you know what that that uh, exemption amount is? Before forty percent uh, gift and estate tax is due, sixty thousand dollars. So sixty thousand dollars for if so if someone were uh, not a a domiciliary of a country with an estate tax treaty, then that's what they would be looking at if they were a non-resident alien. Okay. Annual transfers, as I mentioned before, may be made to a non-citizen U.S. spouse. That, I'm actually not 100% sure of whether that would also apply to a non-resident alien spouse, but that is a truly extraordinary, excuse me, uh, that would, that, that I, I believe it does. I, I believe it does, but I want to double check on that particular point. Uh, $17,000 can go to non-spouses. Um, when I just wanted to, to go back to this, this annual transfer is 175,000 may be made to a non-citizen US spouse. In almost all instances that that comes up, that's the, the American citizen married to the permanent resident. But what I'm wondering is what about the American citizen married? I've got a client, for instance, um, up in Cairns who is, is married to someone who is, has no US ties whatsoever. So what's the gift limit that, that they have? I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. So I'm going to have to double, triple check because we want to be 100% sure of those things. Here's the thing to know, and this is yet another definition that I'll be getting to. So I'm going to define situs and tangible versus intangible property. Gifts of tangible property in excess of these thresholds will be subject to a 40% rate above $60,000 for non-resident aliens in non-treaty countries but gifts of intangible property are tax-free. And that's extraordinary. We'll, we'll get to that. that. That's, by the way, that's a huge planning uh, opportunity right there. So tangible property must not only be tangible, meaning physical and exists in the, in the real world, bound by the laws of, of gravity, uh, but also weighed and physically relocated. Interesting when lawyers get involved in uh, defining these kinds of words. Uh, intangible property is property that does not have a physical existence or that may not, <laughs> may not be felt, weighed, weighed or relocated. It's not considered to be tangible property. There you go. I mean, that's you don't get more um, uh, visceral, right, than that. Felt or weighed. You're like, if you can't feel it or weigh it, well, I guess it's not tangible property. So um, th th there's another clarification here. It refers to property rights rather than physical items. Here's a list. Uh, I don't think that's going to be exhaustive, but for, for most people's purposes, I think this is a this is a pretty good list. Um, the the reason I put coin collections and then monetary assets in the bank is that's a super important and probably the most prevalent of all examples right there. If you own actual cash, meaning dollars and bills or coin collections, can that be felt and weighed? Yes, tangible. If you look, if you log on to your bank and uh, look at your bank balance and you say, gosh, there's my, my bank balance today, is that tangible? No, intangible. 
So what does that mean for the non-resident alien? Something extremely interesting. And that is there's no limit on the gifting of intangible uh, assets that you saw right here. So the, uh, where, where did we have that? That comes back here. But gifts of intangible property are tax-free for the non-resident alien, not so much for the, for the US citizen. Okay, CITUS. So moving on from tangible versus intangible. Now, CITUS and, and, and foreign CITUS, you might think of being the same thing, but there's a subtle distinction between tangible, intangible, and CITUS and foreign CITUS. So, but there's a, there's a strong correlation also. So real property is clearly located in the US. This is the focus of CITUS is the location of the asset. Uh, and so just going back a step, you can have intangible property that is CITUS in the US, but mostly it's not considered CITUS in the US. Um, so personal property, physical dollars, meaning dollars and, 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 and cents, actual coins and notes uh, and other currencies, personality, uh, of course, they're considered US CITUS because they're, they're tangible, they're real, they can be felt and weighed. Uh, and so here is a good list here. And this is worth us going into for a moment. So U.S. CITUS assets would be stock of a U.S. company. And, it, and what actually matters, just for those uh, folks pedantic enough to want to know these definitions, because I only recently came across this, it's the registration, the corporate registration of the company, not the exchange that the stock is listed on. So I don't happen to know of any companies uh, listed in the US that aren't actually also registered in the US. I'm sure someone does. They'll they'll chat in and they'll say, haven't you heard about XYZ, you know, whatever company that's registered somewhere else and is listed in the US that is not an ADR. An ADR is an American depository receipt. Uh, and that is a different thing altogether. That's where it's it is primarily listed in a foreign on a foreign exchange, but then it has, let's say, a a, a shadow listing in the US as well to enhance its trading ability. So that's the difference there uh, between stock of US companies and US listed ADRs. That's like BMW, Siemens, uh, Rio Tinto, all sorts of companies that are listed as in the US as American depository receipts. What else is US side as private debt issued yet? Yeah, and by the way, this, I've, I've said this so many times, the CITUS rules make no sense. They they make no sense at all. Um, but for the in the extreme cases, uh, sometimes they do. But this is a good example, private debt issued by corporations. Why is private debt issued by US corporations, US CITUS, but if they turn it into a bond, and it's a publicly traded bond, magically, it's not US CITUS any longer. Don't know. Money market funds or cash held at a brokerage firm. In very important distinction right here because look at what we see over here. If it's cash held in a bank, not US CITUS. If it's cash held in a money market fund uh, or at a brokerage firm, then it is US CITUS. I, I, I have no idea why that would be the case. But we, we, so we've, we found that dollars, uh, it bills and coins are tangible property and they're US CITUS. And money, money market funds or cash at a brokerage firm is U.S. CITUS, but money held in a bank account is not U.S. CITUS. Business investments, investment assets used for U.S. business and are held at a bank or broker, also U.S. CITUS. Annuities, that's a bummer. I, I, I really, I think there's a good place for annuities in, in most people's portfolios. And thankfully, yes, you heard that right. I'm a fee-only advisor. I don't receive any commissions. And yet I still believe in annuities. There has been a renaissance lately in the last five years with fee-only uh, annuities coming along. So they don't hit you with the big fat um, commission and trailing period that where, where you won't even get all of your money back for eight up to 20 years. Uh, thankfully, they're becoming fewer and fewer. Um, but annuities really deal with a particular risk in financial planning known as longevity risk. And that is no one knows how long they're going to live or the quality of the health they're going to enjoy for the remainder of their life. And that's kind of the, what, what you, annuities do uh, uniquely well. And lastly, qualified retirement plans, so IRAs, 401ks, et cetera, they're US CITUS also. So what's not US CITUS in that case? Well, we've already been over ADRs cash held in a bank account, stock of foreign companies, that's 
I couldn't be clearer, right? If it's not even held in the US, then how could it possibly be US CITES? Publicly traded bonds makes no sense, but it's not considered US CITES. This is why I love, and I've mentioned this on previous webinars and I mentioned this to clients all the time. If you have a need for life insurance and, and many people do, many people don't, uh, if you have a need for it, then I say get it in the US because it's some of the cheapest in the world and it's not US CITES. The death benefit is paid tax-free. It's, it's just better, better, better all, all the way around. Offshore mutual funds, that's a tricky one because if you had offshore mutual funds, then you could run into PFIC, Passive Foreign Investment Company issues, and that's a, another topic for another day. Here's a summary of the estate and gift tax sum, uh, situation here. So you've got US citizens. It's pretty cut and dried for US citizens. They've got their unified gift exemption. If they've got an American citizen spouse, there's an unlimited spousal transfer. Otherwise, it's 175,000 to a non-citizen. That can be brought back in, by the way, again, beyond the scope of today's presentation, but it will be mentioned in a, in a future one I've got coming up. Um, that that is just in the in the very preliminary planning stages where I'm having a, an international estate planner join me hopefully in in May. We'll see. Fingers crossed. Uh, and the way that that is handled is with an I dot, which is a type of trust um, that enables a permanent resident to to receive the full ex estate exemption, and they have uh, almost two years following death to set up. Uh, sorry, I, I said I dot a Q dot. Uh, qualified domestic trust. Uh, I was thinking of a different type of trust. A Q dot, um, which is the way that a a non citizen spouse is able to get the the uh, the full gift tax credit. Non spousal transfer is limited to seventeen thousand dollars. Of course, that's the same for everyone. You see the U.S. resident, which which really means the permanent resident. They get the same unified gift tax exemption, but they don't get unlimited spousal transfers. Uh, and then lastly is the non-US person. I've decided to be nice and, and not call them non-resident aliens. And there's that ugly $60,000 uh, gift and estate tax credit, which, as we know, only applies to what property? US CITES property, correct. Does it apply to gifts of intangible assets? No, it doesn't. does not apply to that. Let's move on to U.S. gift giving. This is something that I have seen whole hour-long presentation, in fact, not whole hour-long, whole day-long presentations on. That's how complicated gift giving is in the U.S. In Australia, it is much simpler, much, much simpler indeed. Um, but essentially in the U.S., if you want a tax deduction for a donation, then it needs to be to a 501c3. And 501c3s, uh, religious, charitable, scientific, educational, certain other exempt organizations. If you want to do your homework, then you double check that. It's all well and good if someone says we're a 501c3, but uh, the belt and suspenders approach is to go and check it because your deduction would be denied if they weren't in fact that. And good luck suing a nonprofit. Uh, and it kind of nullify the whole point of your charitable intention in the first place, right? Um, so I've got a link here, tax exempt organization search. Let's just click on it so that you can see what that looks like. It's very slowly loading. And here it is. So you would come here. Who knows what their IN is? E I N is. Um, you'd just uh, check there. So let's do you know, Red Cross. See what pops up. Hopefully the Red Cross pops up. And And the Red Cross is an interesting one because there's actually uh, the American Red Cross, and then there's the Red Cross, which is a Swiss organization. Uh, and there's, look at that, there's, holy mackerel, there's 10 pages of Red Cross uh, 501c3s. But back to our regularly scheduled programming. So uh, th this is actually, what you see down here is not something that's especially common, um, but it is very, very important for clients interested in uh, planned giving. Planned giving, the, the term given to those thinking of, uh, of making gifts in, in ideally once they've attained financial independence and they want to support a cause or a charity, uh, then this is the, the all important uh, chart to be aware of because it tells you the deduction limitations. Now, there's property that's classified as 
being able to, to be deducted up to 60% of your adjusted gross income, 50% of AGI, 30%, and 20%. Now, 20% is the least generous, and that's where you can donate appreciated property to a private foundation. And private foundations for high net worth individuals can be very focused and can be very um, rewarding endeavors for them, let's just say. Again, topic of another conversation. I'm going to go straight to my favorite, uh, my favorite type of charitable gifting in the US, and that is right here in the middle of the 30% AGI, public charities and private operating foundations. Now, the public charities tends to be the broadest. There's a, a huge list of those 501c3s that we saw just a minute ago, and that was looking at one, one single charity, the Red Cross. Um, but the, the thing that I love most about this one is you can donate to what's called a donor advised fund, appreciated property to a donor advised fund, donating cash. The, the gift planners will tell you this till the cows come home till they could, they could talk a glass eye to sleep, talk the leg off a chair. And they all say the same thing. And that is never, never give cash if you're trying to be mindful of the tax ramifications of your gift. And the reason why is because cash is an asset that is always at par. Is there ever any gain in cash? Do you have a capital gain in cash? No, you don't. You may earn interest on your savings account, but that's different. Cash is the ultimate at par asset versus if you have a highly appreciated asset, you have a charitable intention to want to support uh, one or a number of causes, fantastic. Don't sell that, that highly appreciated stock, take the cash, pay the tax, and then give it to the charity. Instead, donate it to a donor advised fund. You get the fair market value as the tax deduction, which means that the embedded tax liability in having sold that highly appreciated stock was not paid was not paid, or if it was paid, it was paid by the IRS. So that's how you want to do it. You want to be giving through donor advised funds. Now you can only take up to 30% of your AGI as a tax deduction, but you can roll any unused amount up to five years forward. So let's just give a hypothetical example there. Clients done very well, holds a 5 million uh, highly appreciated position in a company that's yet to go public. Uh, they have other assets and they say, gosh, you know, I really don't need that five million anymore. I'm going to give it to the uh, charity that I support. And they do that. They imagine their taxable basis was only $100,000 in that stock. They had a $4.9 million gain. They would get hosed with, with federal tax and possibly state tax, depending on what state they're in. But instead of selling it, converting to cash, where their proceeds likely would only be, let's say, uh, 4 million or less, maybe 3.5 million or less after they pay taxes, they could give the 5 million to that charity and then take a 30% deduction against their AGI uh, in that year. Or if, and if they had sufficient income for the next four years following, they would be able to roll that forward and continue to benefit from that gift. Okay. So how does the American taxpayer contribute if they hear about some appalling earthquake in Syria or Turkey or, or things are poor and uh, you know doing very poorly in some other part of the world and they are drawn to want to support that? How do they do it? Not so easy. And that's the, because tax deductible charitable contributions are not permitted for donations directly to individuals or non-US based charities. So with that said, how do we actually support such uh, causes? And there's three answers to that question. And thankfully, they're doable. They are very, in, imminently doable. One, you make a donation to a US charitable organization that maintains philanthropic operations, excuse me, in one or more of the foreign countries. Uh, now, there's, a, there's some research to do, let's say, uh, suddenly war breaks out in the Ukraine and you see all these women and children fleeing and you want to help. Uh, you don't know how to help. You don't know what charities there are. Where are the American charities that are actually distributing aid right now on the ground in the Ukraine? 
there are various um, yellow, uh, what, what's it called, yellow pages kind of things for different charitable organizations. Uh, but the, the bigger point I want to come to, and this is one that's surprised me in the past, is if you look at the expense ratios of, of the good donor advised funds, they are nowhere near as low as what you would expect uh, them to be. So Vanguard, for instance, charges 1%. Schwab, which is the cheapest I know of, um, is 50 basis points. And the reason for that is because gift giving and donations of property Cash is very simple for them, very, very, very simple. But gifting of property can be uh, very fraught. And oftentimes the gifts are rejected. If you're giving up, there was a great example a few weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal of a, the guy that got um, this pyramid scheme called Market America off the ground. He donated this beat up rotten old boat for what he deemed to be fair market value. And then uh, the IRS uh, went after him for that. So. Uh, that's an example of trying to take a tax deduction that's not really appropriate by donating property and taking in and, and what, what the IRS at least deemed to be uh, an inflated value to get a greater tax deduction. Anyway, I digress. Uh, so the, the giving managers, the giving, uh, the folks that specialize in this charitable planners is generally their job title. Um, they're the ones that would be able to say, oh, you want to give to someone, to an organization in Ukraine or Syria or Turkey or wherever. Um, okay, this is how you do it. Here are the, the American charities that have operations in those countries. So that's point one. Two, donations to a foreign charity that is established as a subsidiary of a U.S. charity. So it's essentially the same thing, but in reverse. So say the first example would be the American Red Cross, whereas the second example would be the Swiss Red Cross that has a presence in the US. Uh, and then the third one, and this is, I think, something that might be of great interest to uh, the, the mass affluent or high net worth folks that are interested in, in seeing what, what can be done to really target the causes that they believe in, is employing either a private foundation or a donor advised fund to make grants to foreign charities. That's where you'd get on the phone to, to, to Schwab or Vanguard or whoever your donor advice fund provider is and say, listen, I really want to support this particular cause in this country. How do we do it? And that's when it takes time and money for them to figure out how they do it and how they make it legitimate uh, and pass all the tests that they need to pass uh, to maintain their 501c3 status. So uh, that's where a good donor advice com fund comes in they're actually really earning their keep in helping you figure out your gifting. If your gifts aren't so complicated, then, then maybe uh, just going for the cheapest option would be fine too. So Australian gift giving, let's move on. Australian gift giving is fundamentally different. I mean, fundamentally different. And the reason for that is because in Australia, unlike the UK, unlike the US, where there wasn't this fantastic amount of wealth built up uh, say in the 19th century, which generated a whole class of people with a stupendous amount of money, Australia didn't really have that. So there hasn't been the impetus to create uh, gift taxes, generation skipping, transfer taxes, things like that. The way Australia works is really very simple, as I'm about to explain. But let me go through in order. So as I mentioned, it's really quite different. In Australia, for income tax purposes, there's no such thing, firstly, as a tax filing status. There is for the, 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 the Medicare uh, surtax le levy uh, for folks that, for, for higher income folks that don't have private health insurance, they will double your benefit if you're married. But for income tax purposes, I found this on the web. Really? Oh, series eavesdropping there, sorry. Um, for, for income tax purposes, there's really everyone is a single filer. The focus that the Australian tax system has is on untaxed gains at the point of transfer. So there's no separate gift tax per se. There's really just capital gains tax that has to be paid on transfer. So uh, gifts are generally not considered income and don't require you, you to pay any Australian taxes. As gifts are untaxed, the ATO is a bit leery about gifts between non family members, they want to see that it's a legitimate gift. Uh, of course, 
there, there are these five tests here that need to be satisfied. Uh, there can't be a, a, a transfer of money uh, for property. It has to be made voluntarily. Donor expects nothing in return. Donor doesn't materially benefit and not regular nor recurring, which is an interesting one, by the way. So a parent to provide an allowance for a child, um, I, I would think that would still get by. But if someone was was looked like they were making an installment payment for something, then the ATO would be would be wise to that. So the way that the ATO thinks about things is essentially you take that asset. It doesn't matter what it is, really, cash, real estate, uh, with with the primary residence exemption, collectibles, artwork, etc. You take that asset, you sell it to cash, you determine if there was a capital gain and pay the applicable tax at the gift or's marginal rate. So the person making the gift is on the hook to pay the tax. Gift or pays it at their applicable marginal rate. And remember, in Australia, there's a, if you're an Australian tax resident, there's a 50% so so-called um, gift tax, uh, not gift, excuse me, capital gains discount, uh, but it's added on to your income that the amount of that gain is added on and then it's half of, of whatever the applicable uh, gain was. So let's say it's a $100,000 gain on, on the sale of some property for an Australian tax resident, $50,000 would be added on to their income and they would be taxed uh, as such. Now, remember from, from previous presentations, non-residents, even Australian citizens, do not get that taxable discount. And that's especially important. And I'm, I'm the one pounding the table. And please do me a favor, everyone that's on this call today, get the word out there. If you hold Australian so-called investment real estate and you're thinking, you know what, I'm just going to wait till I get back to Australia to sell it, don't. It doesn't benefit you in any way to do that. And the reason why is because you would receive the, the capital gains discount for the period that you were a resident, but the period that you're a non-resident, there's no discount. And you have to get a valuation done, one of the methods at least, in probably the best method, although it's going to depend on the individual's facts and circumstances. Probably the best method is to get an appraisal for the purchase, for the, excuse me, for the for the value of the property at the time of departure and the time of return if it's not already sold. And then any gain in that time is simply taxed at the non-resident rates. So whether you sold it from abroad or when you return home, the tax impact would be the same, uh, unless there was a tremendous run-up in the time in the value of the asset after you returned home. But we're not in the business of trying to predict the future. Uh, cash. So there's, as you heard me say before, cash is always a pass. There's no gain there. Primary residence is primary residence exemption. So that is a different one. That's where you actually could gift away a primary residence without any uh, capital gains tax implications because there's no gift tax. It's only ever capital gains in Australia. Investment real estate, same treatment as above. Assuming it's not pre-1985 property, that's before there was a capital gains system was even introduced. If it was post-85, then we just follow this. You sell the asset to cash. You therefore determine it's it's taxable basis. Selling price is, is obviously the proceeds. Uh, and then your gain is the difference between taxable basis and selling price. Pay the applicable tax and you're on your way to gifting that asset. Similar story with stocks and managed funds, collectibles and art. Superannuation is always a complicated one, but essentially the treatment is the same again. And that is if you can't gift it if it's if it's in the um, uh, the accumulation phase. Uh, because it's it's held by a trustee and you know unless you had any number of untoward events occur that you don't want to have occur anyway like financial extreme financial difficulty permanent uh, and total total and permanent disability terminal illness things like that you're not getting it out anyway so forget about it uh, it has to be in the distribution phase in the pension phase in which case it's almost certainly going to be tax free anyway uh, might there be taxable situations that could arise in the pension phase? Possibly, but we're not going to go there. For, for most circumstances, any distribution in the pension phase is likely to be tax-free. So gifts to domestic charities. Uh, gift recipients need not, yeah, sorry, they need to be not-for-profit organizations, but you're not home yet. That not-for-profit for, for in Australia needs to 
have an income tax exempt status and the ATO is a lot tighter about who they're willing to allow you to have a tax deductible donation to. They must have this designation, a DGR designation. And let's take a look at what, what that looks like. So we've seen uh, the IRS have, have their search over here and the Aussies have their search too. So let's say, let's look up the Red Cross. And a, there it is right there at the top, Australian Red Cross. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 goods and services tax, avian details. Okay. Not for profit is registered. Okay. As follows business name. I'm trying to find charity. Okay. Is a public benevolent endorsed to access the following tax concessions? GST, FPT, income tax exemption. There you go. Deductible gift recipient status. Yes. And there they are. That's specifically. So if you were audited and you did your homework and made sure that the it was a DGR that was receiving uh, your, your uh, gift, then indeed it would be tax deductible. So there's a two-step process just to go through that again. What's that two-step process? It's are they an income tax exempt organization? And then second, do they appear on this DGR list? It's much more stringent than the 501c3s uh, because it, it, it's, 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 tax, it's entirely tax deductible. Gifts to a foreign charity are really treated in much the same way as we saw on the US side. So they need to be uh, made to an established Australian subsidiary of an international charity. So Medicine Sans Frontiers, Doctors Without Borders, uh, Red Cross, or the charity, of course, must be an Australian registered, registered charity, and the oldest, coincidentally, of which is World Vision. So that's how you do it. Going back to, you might all recall, about two years ago, I ran a webinar, uh, and it was a premium webinar. There was a fee to attend, but that was uh, in, in, in effort to raise money for the, the women and children of Afghanistan, and that donation was made to an Australian uh, entity that was distributing their funds to uh, to to those in uh, Afghanistan. Okay, that's really a wrap for this week. Uh, please get ready. Type in your your questions if you've got any. Next month, I think is going to be a crowd pleaser. You want to be here. Retiring in Australia, pre move financial planning. So steps to take to uh, to be ready for that. That'll be on April 18th. Uh, if you live in the US, it's a regularly scheduled time, that's 5.30 Pacific, oh, or uh, that's Wednesday, April 19th. And I believe it's actually, there's a typo in that, that Canva there. I believe it's actually 11.30 in, uh, in Sydney or Melbourne. It might even be 10.30 because daylight savings is ending down there. If you're interested in learning more, please come to my website, click on Get Started, and, and you'll see more about the kinds of clients that we, we do our best work with, and uh, you can schedule a, a call from there. Uh, we have our key financial data sheet. It is updated for 22, 23, and we have various posts. Our, our webinars can be found here, flowcharts, white papers, and so forth under our Knowledge Center. So we have one question that's come in from Gerald. Hi, Gerald. What about a reverse on estate taxes? If an Australian-based parent dies and wills Australian domiciled assets to US-based child, is it correct to assume that there is no US tax on the inheritance? That is correct. However, and we looked at that, as you may recall, in Q3 of last year, we went through that in detail uh, on Australian and US inheritances. Um, that's not to say, however, that there wouldn't be any Australian tax assessable on that distribution. So to apply the principles we've learned today, that would be Australian sidest assets. The, there isn't, just to help you out, there isn't uh, a gift tax that the US applies for money coming in. The US is only too happy to see money come into the country. Uh, and, and that would be that. If an Australian-based parent dies and wills Australian domiciled assets, again, it's going to determine, uh, yeah, the, the, the taxation of the assets will, will vary. So there, there, there might be the primary residence, in which case there's a primary residence exemption and there's a, you've got a couple of years to move in and make it your primary residence to, to get that uh, on a tax-free basis. If there's investment properties, stocks, uh, other investments with gain in them, then that gain will be, will be realized. And the, the best thing that can be done, and this is the most valuable 
piece of planning I've picked up in the last couple of years, in the simplest imaginable on this front, uh, is this, and that is that your parents' estate should be, if there's gain assets or the, the gain assets that that do not have any kind of um, tax exemption, like the main residence, for instance, should be sold by the estate. Why? Because if they are, if if Gerald Lucas sitting in Palo Alto is receiving those funds, then you're going to be taxed as a resident or a non-resident, Gerald? Non-resident. And that's no bueno with regards to your tax treatment. You don't want that. So the, the simple advice, ex exactly. Well, not, yeah, ex US non-resident. So non-Australian tax resident. So that is bad news for you. You get hosed with taxes. So you, your parents can actually set up their estate in a way where the, the gain assets are sold at the estate level. And the estate, thankfully, because your parents are in Australia, they are Australian tax residents, they get the resident tax exemption. So that is uh, is the answer, a very comprehensive answer to your question just there. Anyhow, thank you very much. No one else seems to have chatted in. I, I have found that when, uh, when I'm about to wrap up, suddenly everyone uh, pops up with their questions. So maybe that'll happen here today. Um, Thank you, Eric. Uh, I, I hope to, to, to follow up with you later today. Uh, or give tax advantaged estate assets to sibling. E yes, e or tax disadvantaged as assets, one, high gain assets to the Australian resident sibling. That's right, Gerald, just going back to your question. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have, a, everyone. have a wonderful rest of your day. And I'll hopefully see you next month. Uh, please don't keep Arate Wealth Stratus Australia a secret. Um, you can tell these are not very salesy at all. They're intended to be informational in nature. So, uh, so, so please spread the good word. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.